In this next set of videos, I'm going to dive a little deeper into how ERPs are generated in the brain. In almost all cases, ERPs are the result of the postsynaptic potentials that are produced during neurotransmission. Except under extremely unusual circumstances, action potentials can't be detected from the scalp. So ERPs mainly reflect the inputs to a set of neurons, not the output of those neurons. Also, almost all ERPs arise from the pyramidal cells of the neocortex. Pyramidal cells are the main input-output neurons of the cortex, and they have an important geometrical property. They're all aligned perpendicular to the surface of the cortex. But this doesn't mean that they're perpendicular to the scalp. The cortex is all folded up, so the pyramidal cells in different patches of cortex point in very different directions relative to the scalp. Interneurons don't have this kind of consistent geometry with respect to the cortical surface, so they don't contribute directly to ERPs. Okay, now let's talk about how postsynaptic potentials in these pyramidal cells lead to voltages that we can record on the scalp. This will be a highly simplified version of a complex sequence of events. You can read the details in these review papers. If an excitatory neurotransmitter like glutamate is released at the apical dendrites of a pyramidal cell, this will lead to the flow of positively charged ions into the dendrites, creating a net negativity outside the dendrites. Any electrical circuit needs to be completed, so you'll get a net positivity near the cell body. Together, the negatives and positives create a small electrical dipole. By convention, dipoles are represented by arrows, with the arrow head indicating the positive end. In this case, the negative end is toward the cortical surface, and the positive end is toward the white matter. If we instead had an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA released at the apical dendrites, the polarity would flip, and the positive side of the dipole would point toward the cortical surface, and this would reverse the polarity of the voltage we record from our scalp electrodes. From this, you might think you could use the polarity of an ERP to determine whether you have excitation or inhibition, but sadly, you'd be wrong. There are several different factors that combine to determine whether we see positive or negative at our scalp electrodes. We can't usually draw any conclusions from whether a component is positive or negative. Of course, the voltage generated by a single neuron can't be recorded from the scalp. To see a measurable voltage in our scalp electrodes, many neurons must be active at the same time, as shown here. This diagram illustrates a region of cortex that's folded to form a sulcus, with the neurons on one side receiving an excitatory neurotransmitter at their apical dendrites. This leads to a negativity along the surface and a positivity toward the white matter. The dipoles from the individual neurons sum together, and from any reasonable distance, this creates a voltage field that's indistinguishable from a single dipole that's equal to the sum of the individual neuron dipoles. We call this an equivalent current dipole. When someone talks about the dipole for a given ERP component, they're referring to an equivalent current dipole that conceptually represents the summed activity of the region that produces the component. But notice that the equivalent current dipole isn't a great representation of the individual neural dipoles. It has a 45 degree orientation in this example, whereas the individual neurons are all either vertical or horizontal. And the equivalent current dipole is centered in the white matter rather than in the gray matter. That's what happens when we try to simplify a complex pattern of neural activity with a single dipole. It's also important that the cortical pyramidal cells are parallel to each other, allowing their dipoles to sum to a large value. If the neurons were randomly rotated, their dipoles would cancel out. As a result, you can't get ERPs on the scalp from areas like the caudate nucleus, where the neurons are randomly oriented. Now let's zoom out and look at our little area of cortex within the context of the entire head, which we have simplified as a sphere. On the surface of the head, we'd have a negativity on one side of the dipole and a positivity on the other side. The strength of the voltage varies from location to location, and there's a belt of zero voltage separating the negative and positive sides. I'd like to end this video by making four key points about scalp-recorded ERPs. First, the voltages travel from the neurons to the scalp instantaneously. The moment you see an ERP effect is the moment that it's happening in the brain. Second, the voltages we record from the scalp are the actual extracellular voltages produced by the neurons during neurotransmission. When you record someone's EEG, you're picking up the actual voltages created by the neurons in that person's brain. This is very different from fMRI, where you're seeing the effects of neural activity on blood oxygenation, which takes several seconds. A third point is that a given ERP is negative on one side of the head and positive on the other side, with voltage everywhere except at the negative to positive transition. 
Finally, the voltage fields from a given brain area spread out broadly as they're conducted through the brain, and the high resistance of the skull causes them to spread even more widely. In many cases, the electrode with the largest voltage is quite far away from the generator. For example, the N400 appears to be generated way down in the temporal lobes, but we see it on the scalp at the central and parietal electrodes.